Hi, my name is Tiffany Roth and welcome to today's episode of The Insecure Cure. This is a show that is created to help you stop doubting and start truly believing in yourself so that you can create the life that you want. What's going on today in America is so prevalent to this topic because we are all doubting ourselves right now. We're doubting ourselves as humans, we're doubting our safety, we're doubting our ability to overcome this over bearing cloud of racism that continues to be a stain in our country. But we get to start believing in ourselves and creating our own reality. On today's episode of The Insecure Cure, I have two very special guests, Boris Kojo and his wife, Nicole Ari Parker. Not only are they very successful actors in our community, in the African-American community, and actually in the community at large, they are like Hollywood's glamour couple. Um, Boris Kojo, you might know him from the show, The Last Man on Earth, The Real Husbands of Hollywood, Station 19, and Soul Food, where he and his wife met. Nicole Ari Parker actually won an Emmy for Soul Food. She's also known, very well known today for her role on Empire, the hit series. So we want to speak with them today about how they're feeling about racism, because racism is something that um, it doesn't just affect a certain class, a certain success level, it affects everybody. And I think we wanna have a, just a real talk discussion uh, about racism and how it, we deal with it with our children, at work, with the community at large. So we're just gonna dive in to some real conversations and we hope that you guys can post your questions and comments below and I'll be answering them um, on the chat. So you guys, without further ado, please welcome Boris Kojo and Nicole Ari Parker. I am so grateful that you guys are here today to join me in this conversation about racism in America, how we're gonna navigate through it, and how we just feel as black people in society being experiencing this. And it doesn't seem like it's for the first time, like it keeps happening. So I brought you guys on so we could really work together to move this conversation forward in our communities. And when I say our communities, I mean humanity as a whole. We get to address everybody's perspective in order to really create some serious change here. So we're gonna start with, um, I'd like to get like what you guys were feeling on the first time that you saw George Floyd's video um, with the knee on the neck, because since then we've actually graduated some, to some more horrors, okay? But we, from the first time you saw that video, can we just sort of tap into what you felt and what that sparked inside of you? Wow, uh, I think I think there's a couple of things that sort of came together at that point, because we, we're used to seeing those images of, you know, abuse and oppression and police brutality over the years. So it's that's certainly not something that was new, but. I think, um, actually Nicole touched on that a couple of days ago. I think it was a combination of things. Uh, number one, we're in a pandemic. So nobody has had left the house. And of course there was pent, pent up emotion in everybody's heart um, based on what was going on in the world. Um, and then I think uh, the, the video with Amy Cooper in, the, in Central Park, when she sort of weaponized her whiteness and called the police on, on a black man walking in Central Park, and then George Floyd's murder uh, a, a day later, uh, forced people to connect the dots, especially white people, understood how real the issue is. And for me, it was a, a very visceral um, experience watching that video to see this man's knee on George Floyd's neck for such a long time. And then him yelling out for his mom. I think that sort of, put me over the edge. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people felt that way because we saw both men um, unmistakably in the camera in the same frame, um, one being the oppressor, the other the victim. And um, it sort of brought back all these decades and centuries of, of oppression and, 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 and abuse. Um, it was such a pivotal moment, I think, that sort of started this tidal wave that we're in right now. I really like what you said about, I can see them in the same frame. And I like how you sort of put the backdrop of Amy Cooper and then George Floyd, because I think Amy Cooper 
represented that and up until now, which we thought was that sort of silent emotion of knowing that you can use your white privilege as a weapon anytime that you want, but nobody ever really speaks of it. Like, it was like the fact that it got caught on camera was so shocking. And I think that was so, what was so poignant about that is that because some people believe that if you're a good standing citizen and if you're not dealing with crime or you're not in the masses who like, you know, dealt with drugs, whatever, then you're immune to racism. Okay, because there's when I think that when George Floyd died, we saw the humanity, but there's also part of us was like, well, he was a criminal. Well, he had that $20 bill. Well, you know, there's a lot of people who gave excuses and not didn't give the value to him as a person. And that with the backdrop of Amy just was like, this mix of emotions, like what is real here? What is real here? Is this really happening? Are people really still today using their white privilege blatantly and overtly to kill, to destroy? Or is there something, there's there another layer under here that we're missing? So what did you feel, Nicole, when you saw the video? Well, um, I was just, uh, I was disturbed, but I was also amazed at, and with, like Boris said about Amy Cooper, I, the blatant um, display of power uh, was in a way, um, I, I was glad that these two specifically incidents uh, incidences that um, that it was so obvious, you know, because there's a sense that we are are, are hysterical people. Mm -hmm. So when we're dealing with microaggressions on the job, it's hard to complain about a slight from a woman like Amy Cooper. You can't. Well, she suggested that my presence was bothering her. Like she does all these microaggression things. So. You know, I was happy that Amy felt confident enough to to show her face to prove our point. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been fighting mm -hmm. Amy Cooper's all all our lives, mm -hmm. but there's but we just seem like the 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 unhappy black woman at the job or the um, angry black man at the job, and and then with uh, that uh, ex officer uh, Chauvin, the the psychological examination of white supremacy is still marginalized. There's a really, there's a lot of great writing about that historical desire to colonize and dominate and destroy and, and own and wield power against. But we actually saw a white man with his hands in his pockets, um, frozen with his power, his need for power. It was almost, um, it was evil and sexual and, 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 and disturbing in its just, it wasn't a myth anymore. Yes. It wasn't an essay anymore. It wasn't a, a historical um, examination. We were witnessing everything we've always known. Yes, and this is so powerful. This is so powerful, I just wanna stop. It's almost like America got caught with the mask off, okay? Like because like what you're saying, like when you're at work or you know, if you're in, in the classroom or you know, you're anywhere, just driving in the street, you can't really put your finger on the feeling, but it's there. Oh, you can put your finger on the mm -hmm. feeling. It's yeah. just hard to articulate it yes, to affect that's it. It'll change. That's right. You, you know, can't, right. You can't articulate it. So, but witnessing, and I think witnessing it, it wasn't just black people that witnessed it. I think it was that white people also witnessed what they feel and never articulate. Like they know that it's always there as a weapon, 
and they can choose to use it. And for those of you who are watching who don't know, Amy Cooper was a woman in Central Park who um, called the police on a black gentleman who would ask her to put her dog on the leash because that was the law to put your dog on the leash and she um, insisted that he was harassing her she picked up her phone and said i'm going to call the police and say that an african-american man is threatening my life now it was obvious that she wasn't being threatened but the real threat was her whiteness against his blackness and she knew that no matter what played out that the way that society okay, caters to white privilege, even if they didn't take his case seriously, he would be somehow damaged by that incident. So she used it as a weapon. This is what we're talking about. And then if we're talking about the, uh, the incident with Officer Chauvin, it actually shows you how that power is wielded, yes. like you said, and it's wielded in such a way with, he knew that people were filming him, it was overt, and he didn't care. Yeah. Well, you know. He didn't care. He didn't care. But I think that, you know, when we talk about the um, obliviousness of, of, of some white people, you know, it's because I think that there's a whole historic dinner table conversation that happens in their homes and they don't see the repercussions of those thoughts because you know, they still go to work and there's black people at work. So me making racist jokes at home has real no effect on, you know, my coworker, she's fine. Slaves, slavery's over. So mm -hmm. I can still be a bigot and it not have any, 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 I, I can't be held accountable because it can't have any consequences. So what mm -hmm. we got to see is this collective bigotry um, leaking into, um, well, creating us a, a confidence and then leaking over into um, its uh, visibility and then consequences. And mm -hmm. and I think that they got to see themselves. You know, they really, like you said, got yeah. to see themselves. Um, it's really. I think I think there's there's hundreds of thousands of people who have called police on black people in mm -hmm. in the in the safety of their own home. And like she said, they saw themselves uh, uh, in Amy Cooper. Thinking, oh, um, these two black teenagers outside. How many phone calls have happened? Mm -hmm. And and oh they didn't God. think. Or phone calls to management, you know, mm -hmm. to 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 the uh, human resources uh, about mm -hmm. something that is that is completely ridiculous. But again, they they know how to wield their power, um, and you can wield your power anonymously. And I think, like Nicole yeah. said. Uh, the veil has been sort of pulled back and now everything was sort of revealed in, and people saw themselves in that video. Yeah, you know, um, some of it is, uh, you know, generationally passed down, but I think this moment is very powerful for, for people to understand that it is government sanctioned tyranny. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just this psychological, uh, colonizing mentality from Europe um, you know it is it is they secured those feelings with law you know mm -hmm. I've been rereading um, jo Dr. Joyce DeGruy's uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome mm -hmm. and you know she reminds us that the casual killing act of of, of, the, of the 17th century mm -hmm. states um, I'm paraphrasing, but it states something to the effect of if a slave should perchance, the word is perchance, if a slave while being punished by his master or someone that has been uh, directed by his master, if the said slave shall perchance die from the punishment, <laughs> said master will not be held um, accountable. That was on the Virginia law books. They worked in the police brutality into the law, yeah. which is now manifested into immunity, um, um, self policing, self uh, uh, self protection. Um, I was that you're able to say the words. I was in fear. I felt I, my life was in danger. So therefore, I pulled the trigger to a boy running away from me. Yes, you know that's now, actually. I want to now. I'm going to introduce. I honestly don't want to give any more credence to it, but we have to address it, 
Okay, I want to address the Candace Owens of the world who believe that um, racism doesn't really exist and that it only exists because uh, black people are um, engaged in criminal activity. If they weren't having so much criminal activity with the police, then these incidents, incidents wouldn't come up. So, um, you know, I want to get your, I want to get your feedback on that philosophy because a lot of people are thinking that they're thinking that you know black people have so much um, interaction with the police that it's just a sort of a game of percentages if you have more interaction with the police then of course there's going to be a higher percentage of arrest brutality and things like that because the police th therefore have more rights to be afraid i'd like to get your thoughts on that um and yeah just your feedback on that philosophy can we just be silent on her <laughs> can we just not talk about her? yeah i don't want to give her any, any credit at all <laughs> but, but you know you know I, I, think, mean... I think i think you have to um differentiate between um looking looking at symptoms and then looking at at the root of those symptoms it's almost like <laughs> medicare you know if you if you want to treat symptoms the problem will reoccur but if oh. you find out what the what the source of the problem is, so Medicare, the, this insurance? yeah, like 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 the, the the medical issues when when doctors treat symptoms rather than oh medical than the root okay. than the root um, than the root of the problem, and I think uh, she forgets that there's um, a history there that is responsible for those reoccurring symptoms. Oh. Um, you know, there's like Nicole said earlier, there's symptomatic mechanisms that have been put in place. For the past 400 years to ensure that one race had advantages over the other they made sure that as soon as uh, uh, legally the, 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 psychologically yeah the abolition socially act, the, the abolition act happened they made sure that they continued that system of oppression by way of figuring out the 13th amendment for instance how to uh, incarcerate people and then enslave them through the prison system. They figured out how, how redlining would give uh, black people limited access to, to loans, uh, how, how black people would have limited access to insurance, to, to credit in order to build uh, um, you know, assets and to take care of further generations. White people have been able to do that for hundreds of years and black people were left in the dust. So naturally you get to a point where it boils over. Naturally, you get to a point where people are are constantly in fight or flight mode. They're in survival mode every single day for years and years and generations. Uh, and then um, you have a police force, like Nicole said, that enforces those laws in those communities. They're put in those communities with a specific purpose to 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 um, to ignite conflict and to make sure that those prisons are full. Um, so her point is made with a complete 100% lack of perspective uh, in terms of our history. And you mm. cannot uh, separate, you cannot separate the two. Uh, it's that simple. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we'll, we'll leave it at that because you know we do know that it is the cause that we have to look at, not just the symptoms. I agree with you, that was very eloquently spoken. Um, but the cause, okay, let's go back to the cause because that's good. we were brought here about America, I have to say this because um, I've done a lot of interviews about how um, immigrants say that they've come here and they've come here with nothing and they, they pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they were successful. Why can't black people do that? Why can't black people pull themselves up from their bootstraps and, and, and not get into these situations? Now, I have my thoughts on that. Um, number one, you know, the way that we got here in this country, um, contributing to the growth and expansion of America by being captives and, our, and being as a whole, our labor was basically free yeah. labor, okay, for over 300 years where the country grew. And then it was our fight for equality that actually contributed to the Civil Rights Act, which made this a country that people want to come to, to pursue the American dream. But then it's still being held outside, out, outside of us. Like the American dream is still a vision for so many black people, even though it was our fight for the constitutional rights to be actually activated 
that made this country a place where people could bootstrap up from. Okay, so I would like to get your thoughts on that because I do want to expand the conversation um, so that everybody can gain some perspective, so everybody has some skin in the game and we can really make a change. So what do you guys, how do you guys respond to that when people say, well, I came to this country with nothing and I worked my way up. Like what's going the on? Mm -hmm. The operative word in your sentence, I came mm -hmm. to this country. Mm -hmm. I wasn't brought here, I came. I think mm -hmm. that's it in a nutshell. Yep. I mean, you you talk about not you, but they'll they'll talk about that as if we started on the same page. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. it was three hundred years, right? Generations of generations of of first there was slavery, right? Then there was um, you know the, the the Emancipation Proclamation, which we're celebrating tomorrow, right? But mm -hmm. then you have um, uh, sharecropping and people coming back to the plantations where they were slaves and, and, then, and then work, work paying off the owing of what you, your, your crop makes. Then you have Jim Crow, convict leasing, black codes, redlining. Uh, redlining. Um, people don't understand mm -hmm. that the right to vote was just 40 years ago. Yes. <laughs> That, yeah, that's, yeah, do you know 40 50 years ago like that is that is where we are mm -hmm. 60 mm -hmm. i'm sorry 50 to 60 years ago it's, it's somebody who's still living right now mm -hmm. who remembers when their mom and dad got to walk to vote mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we, get and to, we get to dive into that because what you're saying there was slavery okay like from the 1600s to 1865. There was no breaks. There was no breaks from the oppression. It just no changed breaks. form. And no so break. the people who have made it, the people who have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps has been a, um, has been because of, 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 a, of a support system from a community, you know, black colleges, um, black churches sticking together, um, combining finances, two, um, parent two parent households or single mom households, but there was a togetherness of community. And when that was kind of dismantled after during Vietnam, you're taking the black father out of the home. You know, there were thriving black neighborhoods. My mother was born in the forties in the South. Mm -hmm. So she's seen things that we can't even imagine. But what happened is when she was in elementary, middle, and, uh, and, and high school, it was a thriving community. Black mm -hmm. doctors, you look in her yearbook in North Carolina, every single teacher was black. The only white person in the yearbook was the superintendent, right? So you have black, uh, uh, um, the, the beautiful uh, football team captain, but you also have the math and the biology teacher and the home ec teacher. You had barbershops, funeral homes. There were black millionaires. Black, there were there were black communities that were thriving. Oh, then sorry, when then when and then when integration happened, you know if there's still some really older people still alive, black people, they might tell you that integration was the worst thing that ever happened. Because what happened is my mom's black school, high school, no more funding. All those educated, bright, beautiful teachers are now housekeepers Whoa. because the white school's not going to hire them to teach. Now their children, these bright, beautiful children, are now walking to take a bus to walk again to go to the white school, where then their self esteem is destroyed. They're being isolated, mistreated by their fellow students. You know, Ruby Bridges was the was the uh, epitome mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And so then you got this kid who's once the captain of the football team is now sitting alone and being brutalized just to walk back to the bus, to walk back to his house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have that in the in you know during integration, and then you have an attempt to salvage these communities all over America. And then you have the war and you take these young black men out of their homes. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. send them back to a country where there is no- They have no rights. No rights, no regard for mm -hmm. their humanity, no special uh, provisions, anything. So it, it is a, uh, a constant onslaught 
to our abilities, natural ability to to thrive. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that we are extraordinary. The fact that we are actually still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like we are yeah. actually still here. We everything that you could possibly do to a race of people has been done mm -hmm. from the middle passage to the plantation auction block to uh, 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 Jim Crow through the lynchings through the civil rights we are still here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we have to unlike Candace um, we can't we can't afford to throw any of us away Mm. We need all hands on deck. She's so yeah. willing to to toss uh, 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 people aside, and I, I think that, of course, psychologically, she she's fighting her own feeling tossed aside and needs to be seen. But I think that we have to um, have all hands on deck again. Well, that's a very and, interesting concept. And, and, um, and well, go ahead. I just want to say this that. The way that we were dismantled, you might argue, psychologically, physically, mm -hmm. academically, financially, we have to put all those pieces back in place, mm -hmm. right? We have to strengthen colleges. We have to strengthen our financial uh, impact. We have to strengthen our homes and we have to strengthen ourselves. We, especially uh, uh, as black women, we are the last on our list. Mm -hmm. And we have to strengthen ourselves and heal ourselves and 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 take care of ourselves to take care of our families just like black men have to strengthen themselves and take care of themselves mentally physically financially spiritually and 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 come at it from all angles because the other thing is it's not a myth of what happens in black neighborhoods right now I'm mm -hmm. from Baltimore City, right? I lived on a block that had a candy store, corner store candy, typical inner city, east, eastern city, block, inner city block, like Philadelphia, Baltimore, all those cities. And there were three churches near my house, a couple of liquor stores, but there was also two public schools. You had the nice brownstones where the where your black Episcopal preacher lived, your congressman, um, the Honorable Elijah Cummings lived up the street. When I was a little kid, it was Perrin J. Mitchell. Like these were these were what your little kids played in front of the congressman's house while riding the bikes, while playing jacks, while running to the corner store to get penny candy. And the grocery store was. Um, around the corner. So I used to be able to walk to the grocery store, get something that my mom wanted to cook and come back to school, right? I mean, come back home. I took two buses to a private school and took two buses home. And that mm -hmm. was our neighbor. As I went off to college and I would come home to visit, I watched there be less, the church is gone. The second, third, the playground is gone. There's three times as more liquor stores. The grocery store that would service this community is now not even a name brand grocery store anymore. All the food's generic. The cat food is next to the tuna fish. So if you're a 70, 75, 80 year old woman, my mom now has to get an Uber or a friend to drive her all the way to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's to buy collard greens. Well, so what's the answer though? Because like- oh, And the school and the public school, I'm sorry, and the public school looks like a jail because mm -hmm. you're, you're taking those tax dollars. That's what all the police forms are about. This is the result that Candace mm -hmm. is leaving out. Yes. That, that the opportunities are literally siphoned out. The well-being of the community is literally being taken out. So police reform isn't about dismantling the police, but it's about redistributing the, those funds mm -hmm. in the community. Yeah. So when the playground needs a repair job, it's taken care of. Yes. Yes, but I do want to say this though, because um, you, you made a couple of really interesting points. You were talking about the thriving um, community with you know the churches and the grocery stores, and you were able to be there. The, and the and your political figures, yes. And there were political figures, but then so what happened, and why did you then still have to go 
to a private school to get a better education. So if we look at what worked and what didn't work, like what is really the true key to success? Because on the other hand, you can say, okay, well, these communities were really thriving, but not all of them were. A lot of them were suffering and they were not getting equal resources. And that was with the whole uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, separate but equal, even though they were thriving communities, it was not equal. It still wasn't an equal playing field. So where people felt like in order to have equality, you had to assimilate. Like, it, because if it were so great then, we wouldn't have had that need to feel like we need to go to private schools or other institutions or be more integrated in order to achieve certain success. So like, if people were to look at you guys, two a very successful, very successful black couple, thriving, you know, making money, wonderful children. Like, what is the secret sauce for you? And how can other people have access to that? Well, I think what, what she said is poignant that, um, you know, it's been a systematic ciphering of opportunity and resources out of the black community. And so in order to have change, we have to have a systematic mechanism to replenish those opportunities into those black um, communities. That's the only way to 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 get to not even the status quo that that's a way to to reduce the, the 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 gap in in the economic gap the the educational gap the health gap and all the all the gaps that we've been victim of, we've been a victim of um, and in terms of us we're outliers you know we're we're, we're lucky and blessed that uh, we had parents who pushed us and that uh, parents had some access any access uh, I came from a whole different country um, my father's from from Africa and my mother's German so um, I came through a scholarship program to this country. Um, I made a choice to come here. You know, my my family again. My family's from Africa, so uh, that's a it's a whole different story. What what we have to now um, do in terms of tangible change is to hold people accountable who have the power to um, to implement some of these systemic uh, mechanisms, uh, uh, mostly financial, uh, so that we can that we can replenish, that we can fund, that we can support uh, community-based organizations, um, uh, 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 charitable organizations, uh, create new policy reform so that this, this huge gigantic gap um, is closed at least a little bit. Um, and we have to make it sustainable. This cannot be just a moment. This can't be a, 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 a fashionable fad for right oh. now. Um, this has to become a collective effort from all of us, and that's black people uplifting each other, and that's also white people, um, especially white people in positions of, of, of great influence, to make some of these policy changes that allow us to close that gap. Um, I think the next step in our conversation, and again, because I think what you're saying is really real, that this could become a fad when the riots down, die down and, you know, people forget. And then because I think what happens is it gets to be so intense, you know, we, we throw ourselves into it and there's like, you know, right after George Floyd, you know, we have like Rayshard Brooks and like they, it just keeps coming. So people almost want to withdraw from that and go back into the little utopian worlds and like say this doesn't apply to me. Um, and then the whole thing just sort of fades out. So I would say, how do we keep this? Because that's, you know, history, if it's not really addressed, it just repeats itself until we learn our lessons. We need to learn our lessons as a country and as a humanity because it's going to keep getting hotter and hotter and the flames are going to continue to burn. And I think that this conversation gets to be expanded, not only in our communities, but in every community so they can understand that this is not a black problem. It is not a black problem. And as long as we keep it a black problem, that black people are being killed and they have not equal rights and they not yeah, have- it's like access. it's this invisible um, thing where we're just having all these problems, but nobody yes. discusses the problem causer, right? Yes. And I think that, that yes, the momentum has to, has to be from their side in terms of their own um, um, acknowledgement, like that they don't get exhausted 
now they're getting a taste of what we live with every day. Every like they're exhausted by the news. <laughs> they, I've given already. But I think that on the other side, we have to, on some level, focus on ourselves. So mm -hmm. while there is a political movement um, engaging white people and white companies and holding people accountable and reforming the police force, I think we need to hunker down some of us who are in the who are school teachers and community leaders and and um, activists we need to stay mental health professionals we need to, to focus on ourselves while the other fight is going on mm -hmm. so when the huge corporation is ready to hire people we're ready or when we are ready to create our own company yeah. We are ready. I, I remember at some, I, I think it was a, a convention somewhere and with all these corporations talking to young college students and said, you know, I had this, this brother was at like a big insurance company, um, pharmaceutical company. And he said that he has the budget starting with six figures to hire us. He's looking for the young people to apply. He said, but nobody, nobody's taking it. Mm. Nobody's running with that opportunity. He said, it's disturbing that none of us want to be engineers <laughs> or, yeah. or physicists, you know, or that they are forced to think of other options. So I think internally we need to encourage our young scientists, our young lawyers, our young doctors, not just our young, um, entertainers i mean teaching was a was a wonderful profession during my mother and father's time these are people that changed the trajectory of their lives in the 40s and 50s and 60s and and so which created which created a a modern day dynamic where they now are raising a child because somebody instilled in them that looked like them to succeed mm -hmm. in the middle of all that was going on in the 50s mm -hmm. black teachers were talking to black students black students then grow up and then they get married and they want to give their children that same confidence yes. and 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 self possibility right despite all the stuff that was going on um i know i'm i'm very emotional right now because you know my dad is recently having uh, flashbacks from the George Floyd situation, mm. stuff that he's put aside. Um, mm. He just got out of Howard Dental School. He opened, a young black man opened his own practice, standalone practice. He volunteered at an inner city clinic. He's from East Baltimore. And on his way home, a man was behind him, beeping and beeping. So he sped up and moved over to get out of his way. The cops stopped him, uh, choked him, made him get out of the car, choked him. Then uh, uh, my dad said he stood on his toes to relieve some of the pressure. Then he fought back. Then the other cop came out and beat him to a pulp. They had to take him to the hospital before they took him to jail. He had just opened his own dental practice. And so, you know, this is the kind of trauma that we live with, but somehow because of our internal structures were, were in place, somebody had loved him. He had experienced the love of his mother, his father, his teachers, his community. East Baltimore is no joke. It's a tough place to live. And he still had these basic things in place that let him survive moments like that, to go on, to have some kind of self-worth to persevere, and then to give that to his children. So we can't us to underestimate the value of the private securing of our mental and physical and spiritual mm. well-being. Yes. Absolutely. We do have to vote. We do have to get our money right, but we got to take care of the children and the young people with their with their uh, self esteem. Mm hmm. Yes. You know? But when That's they it. are faced with a choice to be what Candace 
uh, Owens likes to, uh, you know, call all of us, you know, mm -hmm. who are her, they have a sense of, I have another option. Mm -hmm. I don't have to sell drugs to help with the groceries. I have another option. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that story hit hard. I'm sure we have so many of us stories of our fathers, um, uncles, brothers, and cousins who have suffered. You know, I have, you have, at the hands of police brutality. But I think what you touched on is super poignant, and that is that one of the negative effects of racism is internal self-hate. And this is where we need to throw off of our backs, you know, those negative effects, even in the language that we use, okay? Even in the N-word that we use amongst each other, which I don't agree with, in the language that we use to affirm ourselves internally, spiritually, and emotionally. Because what happens is we get confronted, okay, with all of these systematic oppressions. And if on the inside, if we're not fortified with truly knowing who we are and knowing our history, we crumble, you know, we crumble on the inside as a whole. And that's some of the pain that our society is experiencing. But I want to, what I, I want to drive home though, is that this, there's both sides of the coin, okay? Because if there's, if we're crumbling because of racism, those who are benefited from it have this false sense of who they are as well. They have a false sense of success and security because just like the ecosystem of nature, we get to live harmoniously together. So if you have the black people who are crumbling under racism, What's happening to those with white privilege? Because if we don't draw attention to, um, it's really almost like a cancerous effect of believing that you're better than others. If you believe constantly that you're better than others, it really is an exemplary effect of your inferiority. If you need to stand on somebody else's shoulders and keep them down and put your knees on their neck to feel better, that is a big, big gaping hole in your sense of self-security. So we need to make sure that this conversation doesn't stay with us. It's a mirror. It's a mirror. We have mirrors in our society of what we're feeling. And so it gets, we get, we both get to have a look, you know, and we, we put it diametrically opposed from black and white, but it's everybody in between. But because, you know, there's black and there's white, you know, there's Hispanics, Asians, Latinos, American Indians. And they say, well, the, what our country is founded on, you know, as Malcolm X said, the chicken comes home to roost, you know, then this violence is because our country was founded on violence. If we want to have peace, we need to both bring peace. If we want to have self-love, we need to both bring self-love. So with black people, we need to bring it to ourselves. And white people, you need to bring it to yourselves. You get to bring it to yourself so that you're actually taking a look at who you're showing up as in the world. Is that okay? Are the Amy Coopers of the world, is that an okay way to be? And until that becomes an introspective look from both sides, we're gonna keep coming back here over and over again. You were gonna say something for us? Well, I mean, it's what Nicole said, it's all hand on deck all hands on deck that's what that means to me that means that you you have to hold yourself accountable as well as um you know other people uh, at the same time and this this started look racism is a way to justify white supremacy that's mm -hmm. how racism came to be because uh even back in the 1400s when exploration first started uh, when the when the Columbuses uh, started being sent around the world by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they were told that they were superior. So it was okay to exploit and kill and rape uh, um, and in, the in, off inferior the inferior races, right? So because a, a, a truly human being, a, a truly human human being, would never do uh, commit such atrocities. So we had to figure out a way how to battle that guilt that moral compass and a way to do that was a justification of being cruel and that's how racism started um so 
Yes, absolutely, you're right. I mean, it's, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy when you don't um, nurture and empower yourself and affirm yourself mm -hmm. um, and hold up a mirror, like you said. And everybody has to do that, but it had to be an impetus to that. And I think Amy Cooper sort of contributed to that, especially people. You know, I, I sometimes I get weary because I feel like um, you can't really we can't really spend too much time trying to get people to feel empathy because they feel so removed from their ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. Your white friend at work has no idea about Columbus. It's being taught in our present day history books as the triangle trade. It, it, it does, and it says carrying things like herbs, spices, gold, fabric, people is like the third thing listed. And fine, maybe Columbus was brave on some level as a sailor, but everything on that boat didn't belong to him. Everything. So nobody talks about that, and it's so far away that they don't feel like, Amy Cooper does not feel like that she's an extension of the Roman Catholic Church or King Leopold. She doesn't feel that. But we still feel mm -hmm. the effects of King Leopold. Yes, so, my God, yes. So, so the so the thing is, is that I don't I don't sometimes I get weary because I don't want to waste any more time trying to explain to people who didn't have the feelings in the first place to stop it organically watching somebody get their hands chopped off and just standing there just having a party around a lynching. How do we think we're going to change that heartlessness? But what we can change is policy because they respond to policy. They, they've made a rule for everything they've ever wanted to accomplish. Being able to kill a slave per chance in punishment to what we owe on our own land to how we can or cannot vote to redlining to all of those things. You put it on in writing, everybody's got to pay attention. So I, I, I appreciate the sympathizers, but I want us to also get some things on paper uh -huh. so we can all at least follow the, the new rules. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, the rules that they put on paper are what we would use really to fight for our civil rights in the Constitution. So that really does. But I mean, it's usually fought. Maybe they put the words on paper, but we have to fight usually with blood. OK, to get it effectuated. So it's like even right now with the riots, like I don't agree with the violence of the riots and the looting and everything like that. But usually, unless you draw some attention to some kind of economic distress, you know, loss of property or something, sometimes even having things on paper is not enough. Um, well, I mean, in terms of in the workplace, you cannot, um, um, they had to put into law about um, um, you know, when people are losing their jobs now, they're saying this is not a reflective of our policy and then they'll cite the excerpt from the policy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that putting it in, when I say on paper, I mean everywhere, in the workplace, on social media, things that are acceptable. Um, you know, Amy Cooper lost her job, you know, because they don't want that. They might even still feel like Amy Cooper. Mm -hmm. But the policy says, yeah. right? The spotlight is on it too. I mean, we're in a different area with everybody with their phone and their camera, but that's a valuable resource because if she weren't on, she would still have her job and her ideas and her principles if it weren't for, you know, technology. So I think the spotlight is on it. And I, you made a really good point, which I actually have never really thought of. And that is in the African-American community, we are very sort of heart tied to our ancestors. Like we, we, I, I feel my ancestors through me. And I think, you know, maybe in other groups, especially with the, with the white community of, in, in America, I don't think there's that same tie to that, to the, to the experiences of the ancestors. There's a tie to the benefits, but to the experiences, because if you tied yourself to the experiences, then you would be able to say, Hey, like I need to, I need to change what happened. Like myself, I need to change in this present day so that what my ancestors did doesn't get repeated. There, I think there's some kind of disjuncture between, because they say, well, I wasn't there. I never owned any slaves. I never did that, you know what I mean? So it's like almost a detachment from those who brought us to this place. 
you know? Tiffany, you know, the, the human zoos, human zoos, as in Z-O-O, still were present in 1955. You steal an African child and put them on exhibit in Belgium. There were human zoos, zoos in New York City. So we're surrounded by people that allow such craziness that the only reason the particular one, this man, um, uh, I think his last name, this African man from the Congo, Batanga, the black clergy from downtown appealed to the mayor and said, we have so many things to fight against, proving our humanity. Please don't make proving our humanity one of them. Mm, yes. They made this man play with monkeys in the zoo. And people would come every Thursday and watch him. And, and, and then the mayor, for some reason, was decided to change it. And then this man spent the rest of his days uh, semi-homeless being chased by white people and teased and, and brutalized. brutalized. So, you know, I, I really think that, like you were saying about lack of con lack of connection to ancestors, their own, um, ours, their history, it's part of the luxury of, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to remember. I'm still fine. I'm still set. Mm -hmm. And they just, um, we just got to get our ducks in a row. I think we have to have a, a fight for, to, 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 um, to be heard, to stop brutality, but we have to buckle down and get some real policy, policy changes and our, and our community strong again. The danger is that, like you said, when we, the, the, one of the effects is racism is um, believing it you know, mm -hmm. internalizing. internalizing and we have to stop that. We have to stop that. Mm -hmm. We can't believe wanna, we're in fear. I want to say something about racism because I mean, I, I just want to get this out there because a lot of people say, well, black people are racist or you're racist. The true definition of racism is um, when you deny someone their basic human rights or their ability um, to work, provide for their families, okay, or to be treated equally under the law based on an entertain an unchangeable characteristic. Um, so racism is when you use some external features of a certain group to, to deprive them of their rights, okay, to education, to provide for their families, to be treated equally under the law. Everything else is prejudice, bias, self-hate, but racism in and of itself is a systematic, that's the systematic part of it, um, oppression of a group based on characteristics that can't be changed. And so we get to look at that and that's where the system is. And then the emotional um, effects of that racism, the psychological effects of that we get to heal you know, by learning our history, by um, building each other up, by supporting one another. But as far as the next movement, okay, as far as the next movement, we do need to dismantle racism as a system. Now, the next question that I want to ask you guys is the term that's now coming up, anti-racism. What do you think about that? Well, it, it just, it's almost a wake up call for, for white people to <clears throat> make them understand that um, just not being a racist is not enough anymore. Because um, there's a lot of aspects of racism that are not overt. It's not just all about violence and hatred. Um, there's uh, apathy, there's ignorance, there's white privilege, there's so many different aspects that lie underneath the surface that are not easily detectable. And um, so it's a way, it's a way to, um, to appeal to people 
that it's not enough to straddle a fence anymore. It's not enough to, to speak up when it's convenient and to be quiet when it's not or when it's uncomfortable. Uh, that we are in a time now where, like Nicole said, you know, all of a sudden, and white people have to be anti-racist, they have to condemn racism, they have to speak out for uh, uh, black people's lives, black people's rights, uh, they have to acknowledge their privilege that has been built over 400 years, um, systematically uh, built over 400 years, and therefore somebody had to pay. And black people were the ones who had to pay for that. And so acknowledging it, accepting it, uh, and then talking about it with other people, and then taking steps, tangible steps, to have a positive impact on somebody else's life. Because the truth is that nothing's gonna change until people get involved who are not affected. Mm. Um, Yes, we can look inwards. Yes, we can uplift each other. Yes, we can be accountable for what we're doing, how we speak about each other and fight and protest. But let's be honest, unless the other side does something and something that is impactful on a policy level, uh, nothing will ever gonna change. I just think it, I think you're so right, and baby, but I also think that like, it, it's going back under the category of dealing with people who, not all, I have really amazing friends who are not black. I have Korean friends, I have white friends, I have white Jewish friends, I, you know, we all do. But when we just think of it as a whole, it's all going under the category of teach me how to be a human being. <laughs> and, and, you know, there has to be, like I said, all hands on deck does mean that there has to be a group of people that writes out the steps for them. There has to be a group of people that says, okay, this is racism, and then this is anti-racism. Anti-racism could be a gesture like speaking to the other parent who was black, who was at your school instead of staring at her. If that's all you can muster, that goes under the list. It might mean asking someone. I had a white person ask me, how are you doing? I almost burst into tears. Just a random white lady in the grocery store she didn't understand how impactful that was to me, not because she was necessarily asking me how I was doing, because historically, she it took a lot for her to do that. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Do you know what I mean? I was a stranger to her. Um, it, so, I mean, it's, it, but it, it's all on the list of teaching them how to be human. So my point is that the, the small gestures work, but also if you run Nike, and how, what's the percentage of our business? What are the numbers that we provide as a community? Oh, we, we make up um, $15 billion in revenue every year. And Nike just pledged $100 million over 10 years for uh, black community organizations. That's $10 million a year compared oh. to the $15 billion that we as black people generate for them. So it's a joke, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a Band-Aid. It's, it's charity. And as long as white people think that giving back Yes. Uh, on, a, on a charitable on a charitable level is sufficient nothing will change so i think oh. all of these things are on the list from good morning to let me put the money back into the public school system so good teachers will keep the kids interested and they'll feel satisfied and they'll feel validated and kids won't be on the street corner at 12. candace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm wow saying? you guys are so powerful you guys are so powerful i'm so happy that we were able to open up this conversation um, I, I love what you said, Boris, right now about like, you know, if the solution, okay, that's, that's one thing that you can do is that you can invest in, you know, the black communities because money is necessary, but we pour money into the system. We pour money. We're one of the largest spending groups, okay, into the system. So it's really not just about giving back. Like you said, Nicole, it's about how, how do I get to be a better human? That's the why. If you're gonna effectuate any change, because if you're a beneficiary of a privileged system, why would you wanna change it? There has to be a purpose. There has to be a why. Otherwise, they won't wanna change. 
Why do you want to change if you have all the power, all the resources, all the money, all the education, and all the benefits thereof? Unless you decide that it's valuable enough to be a better human. Be a better human. So, you know, I was talking with my husband about anti-racism. It's almost like saying anti-divorce when you really want to be married, okay? We need to focus on pro-humanity. Pro-humanity. Because racism in and of itself is a very divisory term, you know? And, and the only way that we're going to get people, because we got to bring the privilege into the conversation, otherwise they're going to grip everything they have, okay? And fight it with fire, brimstone, and blood to protect it until we say, what about your humanity? Yeah, but you know, I just, you know, the problem is that that humanity is such a broad term mm -hmm. that somebody who's been privileged all their life, uh, they can spend fifteen dollars a month on saving uh, uh, poor homeless dogs, and they will satisfy that 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 feeling of being humane, right? Or they will they will spend five dollars at the grocery store to to support uh, poor children in India for instance, right? So if you ask them about humanity, they will they will reply with a big yes. They say, yes, I am absolutely. See, this is what I've been spending on the poor children in India. Yeah. And and that's again, that's not enough. That's mm. not being a, that's not being accountable for the fact that your forefathers put in place systems that will uh, uh, ensure that you'll be privileged uh, your entire life. That's not what that means, right? Because mm. Uh, yes, I understand that it was your father who strung up my father and that it has nothing to do with you. I understand that. But if I'm your friend and I walk in your door without clothes on, haven't eaten in weeks, and all kinds of other things that have happened to me as a result of your father stringing up my father, then yes, you do bear a certain responsibility to, to uh, reflect on your humanity and to help me out if you say that my life matters, mm. right? It's not enough to just say, yes, I, I acknowledge that your life matters. No, you need to show me that it matters. Mm. And sometimes that means coming out and greeting me and giving me a pair of pants and making sure that the system around us doesn't victimize me and oppress me anymore, especially if I have the power to do that. Um, so I don't think it's enough to just remind people of their humanity because they have all kinds of mechanisms in place to, to defend their humanity that they have. I think we need, like what you said, like really, the word is action. It gets to be a verb. It gets to be a verb because I think it's not like because there's such an inequity, you know, um, in the money. The money is valuable, but we do put the money in. But but pro humanity, and I guess it, it is very broad. But it gets to be a verb on every single level, on every single level. Because I think what happens is like the, like those microaggressions can be also um, flipped on its head. Okay, to um, I don't know what would be the word. Not microaggressions. It could be. Um, uh micro optimistic actions micro connections yes instead of doing micro aggressions we can do micro connections that's kind of brilliant. you know yeah. micro connections so it gets to be a verb on how we get to see each other as humans you know what's so funny about that i think you need to write that down micro connections a manual of how to be a human being <laughs> yes and um, the interesting thing, we go back to the beginning of this conversation about our resilience as a people, right? Mm -hmm. And how the, the ironic thing is that it is actually our humanity that has made us survive yes. in 1619, right? To 2020. Our humanity is the very thing that kept us alive because we didn't fight back in numbers, right? 
And the interesting thing is the lack of humanity is going to be other people's downfall. Yes, that's it. And, we're all, and, and then, you know, our humanity is what made us keep going, keep uh, making a, a, a dollar out of 15 cents, making our lives in spite of, um, you know, uh, doing what, you know, my dad shined shoes as a kid and drove taxi cabs to get in to pay for school. And all, I mean, we are resilient and, 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 and all of these things that we don't, um, celebrate, but their lack of that is what they're almost asking us to teach them. <laughs> you know, like, how do I, how do I have the same, for, same fortitude as you? But I think that what you said is really, really poignant about let's focus on being better humans. Let's make that our purpose. Just let that sink in for a minute because we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. We have to realize, really, as humans, this, it has to be a different narrative. And there are people out there. There are people out there that are throwing the towel, but you know what? If they have the luxury to get tired when it gets hard, if they have the luxury to take a break from it, if they have a luxury to say, oh, this is too much right now, I'm going to rest, I'm going to back off, okay? That's not humane, that's not pro-humanitarian. So we get to focus and we need to make sure that conversation is consistent about becoming not only better individuals, but a better society. And the way that we get to do that Thank God, you know, we just, through this conversation, came up with that. It's with micro connections. Micro connections. The power of those micro aggressions is huge. We can flip that. Give the man the loan. Let the guy in the school. Pass the right law because it's right. Tell your fellow police officer, this is not okay. You're the blue line. Tell your brother, stay in school. Drugs is not the only way. We all get to participate. We all get to be accountable because we can't stay in those bubbles. We already have proven those little bubbles don't work. We get to figure out how we're going to be better together. Better together. So I'm gonna wrap this up because we could talk forever, okay? <laughs> and, um, but I'm extremely grateful to you both for not only coming on the show and speaking openly and honestly, but also for bringing your perspective on history, on culture, on what this means to you, bringing your passion, because you're setting an example for conversations all over the world to get real. You are setting an example for people to be accountable. You're setting an example for people to get out there, change policy and vote. You're setting an example that it's not enough just to give money. That you get to be proactive, be proactive in making this right. So in having this conversation with you, I think this is one of those conversations where we did move forward a little bit. We get to move forward in every single conversation that we have. Silence is opposition. Silence is opposition. So on those moments when you see something happening that you know is anti-humanitarian, you get to speak up. In those moments 
When you're not feeling good about yourself, black or white, look for support. We get to support each other. And there's moments when your brother is hungry. Don't just give him fish. Allow him to fish. So these are all the things that we can do. Like a lot of times I think the conversation gets so frustrating because people don't know what to do. They don't know how to fix it. And there's a saying, if it's up to, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. So that takes the they out of it and it gets to put each and every person into proactive action to make a change. So thank you guys for bringing this conversation to the table because it's a very valuable one. I hope that we get a lot of comments and feedback um, so that we can open up and give birth to more conversations around the world. We have to continue to be tenacious um, in creating change. Uh, we do have the power to do that with our thoughts, with our actions, with our words, with our spirits, with our ancestors. We can make a difference. So thank you guys of so course, much. I'm thinking of like a thousand more things to say. I hate it. <laughs> it's such a long conversation. And I mean, we could have it. We could have it again, you know? We could put the conversation yeah. out. We can have it again because it's not, it's not something that's going to be solved in one conversation. But something no. said in this conversation will spark 10 conversations. And of that 10 conversations, will spark 100 conversations. And it will actually maybe elicit some change in individuals, okay? So that they want to be proactive in their purpose. So it's like every conversation gets to happen. We get to speak up. Those of you out there who are being silent, don't be afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing. Say something, do something, create a conversation because with that, it's gonna give birth to a greater understanding, therefore greater connection. All right, closing words from you, Leg, from you wonderful, beautiful people. What do you got to say? Oh, well, um, I think with all of everything we're talking about, we, we also have to um, make sure that we don't fall into a trap of, of um, over romanticizing saving our people because we are people too. Mm -hmm. We are capable of being selfish and um, not the best human beings or angry about something and have it not checked and it manifests in a certain way. And even if we are all hands on deck, we have to accept there's going to be somebody that, that goes astray mm -hmm. or, you know, that, that, that we have to put our best um, foot forward, but that's, there's going to be some fall off and, and that, when we talk about structures in place, maybe the second wave is to make sure there is ways to catch the fall off. You know, we're always going to have that one uncle who, who, who became addicted to something. Yes. Who's trying to make ends meet. We're always going to have that one cousin who went astray or that one sibling who went astray. But when everybody has all hands on deck, there is something in motion, the, 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 the rehabilitation that he has access to, the mental health she has access to, mm -hmm. the child care she has access to. So <clears throat> we do have to, I believe, like we talked about, put the, put the uh, bullet points on how to be a better human on the, on the whiteboard. But we also have to catch make sure things are in place to, to catch us all for, for as, as much as we can. Yes, yes. Boris? What she said. Always what she said. No, no. no I, I, look, I, I, Tiffany, I appreciate you uh, inviting us and um, to have this dialogue. And I just hope, my hope is that uh, we find a way to make this a, an ongoing uh, sustainable effort with real impact. And uh, again, we, ho we hold each other accountable um, because I don't want this to die down in three weeks. Um, yes. It would be a tragedy. I think, I think there's a reason why this happened now 
I think God knew what she was doing in uh, creating this pandemic and uh you know the economic getting our the, attention the economy economy the, uh, the crash in the economy and and um yeah because she wanted us to pay attention and i know yes, that we would end up to to really make some some impactful changes yes i agree with you 100 percent. i 100 percent. so you guys thank you so much for being on the insecure cure the place to be to stop doubting and start truly believing in yourself. You guys have been exquisite guests and I hope to see you again to continue this conversation. All right, you guys, we're signing out and remember as always, we are better together. <laughs>